Yeah, let's see how this looks. Uh oh, I'm gonna have to change my seat. Let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna have to change. Hold on, guys. Let's see. Yep, let me go this way. All right, hold on. How you guys doing? Okay, how's the quality? Uh oh. Hopefully it'll be okay. Okay, how's everything? How's the connection? Is it okay? Okay. Yeah, this is the best I can do, folks, guys, until I can get better internet connection or get my own place sooner than later. This is the best I can do. So keep praying for that. Ask Jesus to bless my stay here, to plant me firmly here, to grant me favor, miraculous grace and favor in the hearts of everyone, to work with me and help me <clears throat> to take it to the next level for the glory of Jesus Christ, to provide the provisions needed and to find the place. So for now, this is the best I can do, right? So hope you guys don't mind. You know, in Jesus' name, we ask the Lord Jesus to bless this session, bless this time, bless the internet connectivity, bless us all and fill us with his presence. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. So Father, we ask, please protect us from all distractions of the enemy, from all attacks. <clears throat> and Father, please <clears throat> bless the sound of my voice, bless <clears throat> the internet connection. And Father, please grant us clarity of thought and speech and fill us with knowledge and wisdom and power from the Holy Spirit. Enable me by your spirit to recall scriptures perfectly, interpret them correctly and perfectly, and purify our hearts and our motives in the holy blood of Jesus Christ. Wash us in the blood of your son, Father. Wash our loved ones in the blood of Jesus. Wash my daughters in the blood of Jesus and seal them. Seal us by your spirit, Father. Please, again, I ask, Father, we love you. We love the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit. Use me to glorify the name of Jesus. May Jesus Christ increase in us. May we decrease and save me from being unnecessarily offensive, Father. Bless this time, Father. Please, we ask that you guide this conversation. Anoint my thoughts, the words of my mouth. Save me from confusion and stammering and distractions of the enemy as we're covered by the blood of Jesus and sealed by your spirit for the glory of Jesus. Surround us with a wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. And I include my daughters in this prayer as well, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy Spirit, have your way. Okay, guys, this is your opportunity to ask me questions, right? God bless you, 1611. You're on your way to heaven. Okay. So, Meso, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. You better change your name if you want me to pronounce your name. What's there to respond to? In fact, here's the question I was asked about Mark 16, 9 to 20. I keep saying <clears throat> this name, and I'm going to repeat his name again. Okay, guys, pay attention. I'm going to try to take whatever question that I believe is pertinent. I mean, all your questions are important, but for this time, I have to choose the questions that I feel are necessary to be answered for now. All your questions are important, but I'm not going to have time to address all of them. Trusting the Holy Spirit to guide this conversation, anoint me to answer questions correctly for the glory of Jesus, right? What's there to answer when you say Mark 16, verses 9 to 20? I keep mentioning a brother named James Snap. Thank you, Protestant believer. So however you pronounce your name, Ori, Protestant believer, this just posted the link to James Snap's YouTube channel. James Snap, in my estimation, is one of our best evangelical New Testament textual critics. He's produced an ebook, I believe it is, on Amazon, <clears throat> which I think you can even get for free. He has a blog, Text of the Gospels, and a YouTube channel. And he has, pre he has presented the overwhelming textual evidence, the overwhelming textual evidence and the historical evidence that Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, is a genuine scripture inspired by the Spirit penned by Paul. I'm sorry, did I say Paul? Lord Jesus, protect me from error and cover us by your holy blood, the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, we love you, Father, Holy Spirit. Boy, all right. Penned by Mark. Mark wrote the gospel attributed to his name, 
and the overwhelming textual historical evidence shows he wrote Mark 16 verses 9 to 20. Now, I'm a student of these scholars, so I highly encourage you watch his responses to <clears throat> John MacArthur and others and read his posts and his booklet. The evidence is massive. In fact, I just left a note for myself in the Gospel of Mark in my King James Bible, which is the Bible I read from. This is it right here. All right. Let me just read the note that I wrote for myself. Okay, let's see if I find it. Okay. So if I find it, yep, let's see. I wrote it somewhere. Hmm. Let me see if I have that note. I hope I do because I want to have it with me. I can't carry all the booklets here. Listen to the to what I wrote at the ending of Mark 16 in my Bible, the King James Bible. This is the Bible that I read from and I carry with, carry with me. Are you ready for the answer, Ori? Okay. Are you ready? Just want to make sure you're listening. Okay. 99.5%. These statistics come from James Snap. 99.5% of existing manuscripts contain Mark 16 verses 9 and 20. That's over 1,600 manuscripts that include it, such as Codices A, D, and also Irenaeus, Quotes 16, verse 19. Did you catch it? 99.5% of the manuscript evidence, 99.5% of our existing manuscripts have Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. What's up, bro? And that's over 1,600 copies of Mark. All right. You with me there? I didn't. I didn't see your answer. So, that was my oldest brother right there. We all look like a, We all look like each other. Ninety-nine point five percent of the manuscripts in existence that do have Mark, and that do have Mark sixteen. Mark sixteen, right? That have Mark sixteen. Ninety-nine point five percent of those witnesses include verses nine to twenty, right? That's over sixteen hundred existing manuscripts. You're not going to find that information in your textual critical notes in their modern versions of the Bible. Sorry for that. In Jesus' name, yeah, hold on. I'll just Sorry for all the distraction. How you doing? All right. Okay. Okay, so go to James Snap's YouTube page. Watch his videos demonstrating that Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, is part of what Mark originally wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Get his... Ebook on Amazon, I think you call it an ebook, and also go to his blog. Put in James E. Snap, S N A P P. Okay. Now, folks, this is your time to ask me questions, trusting the Holy Spirit to fill me and guide me to answer whatever question the Holy Spirit wants me to answer. So go ahead, hit your best shot. Uh, why would I educate a non Rashid when he's not here? Don't ask me to answer a question for someone that's not here. Okay. And so what is Adnan Rashid's objection? What is his point? AJ Law, can you tell me what the argument is? Because I'm going to show you a better way of refuting these Mohammedans who are inconsistent and dishonest, dishonest because they're imitating their prophet. So what is the specific objection? As the Holy Spirit loosens my tongue for the glory of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'll go here. Okay. What's the objection? The angel of Jehovah, Yahovah, in Zechariah chapter 1, 2, and 3 is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, AJ, can you articulate your question more clearly? Are you saying that Adnan Rashid says, because the Gospels are in Greek, and yet Jesus spoke in Aramaic. We don't have the words of Jesus. Okay, so, but what's the argument? Let's say Jesus only spoke Aramaic. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? Uh, 
What's the big deal? So AJ, help me understand what the objection is. So what? Okay, so he spoke only Aramaic. And? I'll get to the questions one at a time. I'm just taking this one first because he wants me to respond to Adnan Rashid trying to prove that Jesus spoke Greek. Okay, even if I couldn't prove that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke Greek because he had interactions with Gentiles and Romans who are not required to speak Aramaic. Let's assume he only spoke Aramaic. What's the big deal? What does that prove exactly? So AJ Law, either you're going to tell me why he made that objection or you don't understand his objection. Which is it? Here's what I'm waiting for, AJ, to answer, because I don't want to delay my responses because I don't want people to get bored. I want to bless you guys for the glory of Jesus Christ. This is why I hesitate to do live Q&A because there is a delay. Okay. AJ, if you don't answer the question directly, friend, I'm going to send you on your merry way. Notice what you did. I can't understand why Christians cannot answer questions directly. Your final shot, brother, because you just wasted our time. Let me repeat again. Even if Jesus spoke only Aramaic, what does this prove? Why did Adnan Rashid raise that as an objection? Yeah, I know Brother Bass. He did. So here's what I want you not to do in the future. This is for everyone. Don't repeat the argument of a Muslim if you don't understand what his argument is. I know what Anan Rashid was trying to say. Okay. I know his objection, but I don't want Christians to parroting objections by Muslims who did not understand what the objection <clears throat> is intended to prove. Okay. Well, whatever questions you want to ask, go ahead. And as the Spirit moves me, I'll answer whatever question I trust the Holy Spirit to impress on my heart to answer. So we're trusting the Holy Spirit because, I, of course, I can't answer every question, nor am I qualified to answer every question. Okay, so AJ did not respond. All right. Hmm. Okay, now let me explain to you. Guys, I need your ears. Let me explain to you why Adnan Rashid argued that Jesus Christ, our Lord, only spoke Aramaic. You guys ready for the objection? Because AJ didn't know it. So he's parroting an objection he doesn't understand. Don't do that, Christians. Christians, as a brother, let me chase you in your love. Don't parrot objections of people you don't understand. Okay? Don't parrot, repeat the objections of those you're witnessing to if you don't understand what their point is in raising that objection. Okay. Here's his point. You don't have the original words of the Lord Jesus Christ in his mother tongue. You have a translation in Greek. And in translation, you lose a lot of meaning. Do you understand the objection now? This is a common canard, a common objection by Muslims. Okay. Muslims will tell you Matthew, Mark, Luke, John are written in Greek. The historical Jesus would have spoken Aramaic for the most part. <clears throat> Therefore, you don't even have the original words of Jesus in his mother tongue. You have a translation in another language that's not completely identical to Aramaic so that you can't precisely and perfectly carry over the precise, precise nuance and shade of meaning from Aramaic into Greek. You understand this point now? You understand what he's trying to prove? That we don't have Jesus' original words in his mother tongue. We have a translation, and a lot gets lost in translation. To prove that the Lord Jesus Christ would have spoken Aramaic for the most part, that doesn't mean he didn't speak Greek. Let's look at Mark 5, 41. Mark 5, 41. It's irrelevant whether the writers are multilingual. The objection is that Jesus Christ, who is the inspired spokesperson of God, 
When he spoke the words of God, he did it in Aramaic, and all you have is a translation. But now read with me. Mark 5, 41. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha qumi. See, that's Aramaic. Talitha qumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. So Mark gives you Jesus' words in Aramaic and provides the translation of those words in Greek. Okay, now another one. Mark 15, verse 34. No, not Hebrew. This is Aramaic. Mark 15, 34. Rina, you're still not getting the point. It is irrelevant whether he had few conversations with Romans or Gentiles. Most of his conversations were, were with fellow Jews so that we assume that in most instances, the majority of time he spoke Aramaic. Okay, here's another proof. Mark 15, 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did you catch it? So Mark again gives you the words of the Lord Jesus in Aramaic and then translates them in Greek. And we get the translation of the Greek translation of Aramaic into English. Okay. So now how do you refute this objection? Are you ready for the response? I don't think much of that, Rocco. I'm not Eastern Orthodox, so don't ask me that question. Ask an Eastern Orthodox who knows his theology and is qualified to answer that question. Okay? But let's focus here. Here's the answer now. Here's the answer. Are you ready? Okay. Here's the answer. Okay. Let's respond to Adnan Rashid's canard. Here's what I would do. Pay attention, AJ Law. Everyone pay attention because the Muslims will bring this up. You say, okay, good point. We have a Greek translation of Jesus's Aramaic words, but let me ask you a question because we want to be honest and consistent, not duplicitous. Okay. The Quran, according to your tradition, was written in the seventh century dialect of Arabic called Quraysh. It's in the Qurayshi dialect. He's going to have to say yes, right? Because that's Sal Bukhari, Sal Bukhari, write this down, Sal Bukhari. <clears throat> Volume 6, number 510. Volume 6, number 510. As the Holy Spirit enables me to recall information perfectly. Yes. Qureshi, exactly. Qureshi dialect. Okay. So then you ask Adnan and the other Muslims, doesn't the Quran quote the speeches of Adam, of Satan, of Cain and Abel, of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Ishmael, of the 12 tribes? of Moses and a host of others, including Jesus and his disciples. Doesn't the Quran quote the speeches of all these individuals? They'll say yes. But did Adam speak Qureshi Arabic? Did Satan, Iblis, speak Qureshi Arabic? Did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Ishmael, the tribes, Moses, Jesus, and the disciples speak Qureshi Arabic? Did any of them speak the dialect of Arabic of Muhammad? Oh, you, oh, so you don't have the words of the prophets. You don't have the words of Jesus. You don't have the words of the apostles. You don't even have the words of Satan, Iblis, <clears throat> quoted in their mother tongues. What you have is an Arabic translation of their words. So then... That means, according to you, the Quran cannot be trusted. It should be trashed because it doesn't give us the words of Jesus, his followers, of Satan, Iblis, of Adam, of Eve, of his, their sons, of Moses, and so on and so forth, in their mother tongue, in the language they spoke. So all you have is a translation. And because you have a translation, you can't trust it. Now trash your Quran. Now he's going to say, oh, but wait, wait, wait. Allah revealed their speeches to Muhammad in Muhammad, Muhammad's mother tongue. So we can trust that the Quran gives us the accurate translation of their words. Oh, I see. So Allah can do that for Muhammad in Arabic, but he can't do it for the gospel writers in Greek. Because Allah has a hard time in Greek. He can only do it in Arabic. 
You caught it? Did you see how you respond to that? Exactly, exactly, Letton. So your God, Allah, has a hard time translating words from one language into another, except if it's in Arabic, because he can't do it for the Greek Gospels. Okay, so what you learned today, AJ, is understand the objection that you're raising, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, learn how to refute it. Dog, I like that, Andrew. It's in the Qureshi dialect. Okay, now I, wa I was asked the question. Okay, this one I'm going to answer. Did Jesus tell the disciples they can forgive sins? And if so, can man forgive sins just as Jesus did? All right, let's answer that question. Let me take this question next. All right, John chapter 20, verse 23. John chapter 20, verse 23. Let's answer this question. And then Rebecca will answer your question whether we, whether we can have female pastors. I know this is controversial. I'm going to upset people and I'm going to anger people. But you asked me the question, right? Okay. Now, John chapter 20, verse 23. Jesus, our Lord, speaking to the disciples, the apostles, as he's about to commission them. Whosoever sins, ye remit. If anyone sins, you forgave. They are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now, this passage is raised for one of two reasons. It's raised by Muslims and anti-Trinitarians to prove Jesus isn't God because he had the power to forgive sins. Because if that's the case, then the disciples must be God because he gave them the power to forgive sins. Right? So let me break down why this passage is quoted. It's either quoted by anti-Trinitarians to prove that just because Jesus forgives sins, that doesn't mean he's God because he gave that same authority to the disciples and they cannot be God. Okay, do you understand one of the reasons why this passage is cited? It's used to prove that Jesus can't be God. Now, those who are Trinitarians and are Christians will use this passage for another reason. This passage is cited by apostolic churches. When I say apostolic, I'm not talking about the modern apostolic movement. I'm talking about churches that have been around historically before Protestantism that claim their origin from an apostle or their companion, like Roman Catholicism, Orthodoxy, Nestorian Church, Coptic Church, etc. The reason why they quote it is to show that priests have been given the power from the Lord Jesus Christ and through the apostles to pronounce a person forgiven of his sins or pronounce that that person remains in his or her sins. You with me there? You with me there? You, you understand the two reasons why this passage is, is cited? Christians who are Trinitarians who claim their churches are from the apostles, use this to justify that their bishops and priests have been given authority to forgive sins without this making them divine because Jesus gave them that authority to stand in his place. Anti-Trinitarians use it to show, see, since the apostles can forgive sins, they're not God. Jesus doesn't have to be God to forgive sins. You mean there? Mortiza, ask me what's my WhatsApp number one more pl time. Please, I dare you because I'm going to block you. Please do it. Ask me one more time. Okay. Now, number one, is this passage saying that the apostles, like Jesus Christ, can say, your sins are forgiven you? <clears throat> or is this passage trying to tell us something else? Okay, first of all, let's read the passage in context to show verse 23 does not refute the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you read in context, it actually shows that what Jesus is doing is something that only God does because he's God in the flesh. Are you ready now? Let's refute the misuse of this passage by anti-Trinitarians. Are you ready? Okay, if you're ready, let's read John 20. 21 to 23. Let's read it.
John 20, 21 and 23. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you, as my father has sent me, even so send I you. Like my father sent me to preach in the world, I now send all of you to preach. Now watch 22, catch 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosesoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosesoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now did you catch what he did in verse 22? Jesus breathed on the disciples the Holy Spirit to give them spiritual life and power from the Holy Spirit. Here's my challenge to all anti-Trinitarians. I want them to quote a single passage in the Hebrew Bible where someone other than God Almighty breathes the Holy Spirit upon people. Jesus breathed spiritual life upon the apostles in the same way that Jehovah God breathed biological life into Adam and breathes the Spirit upon his followers. Did you catch it? So the very context of the passage shows Jesus is doing what only God can do. Like the Father commissioned the Son and sent him into the world, Jesus is now commissioning the apostles and sending them into the world. So he's doing for the apostles what the Father has done for him. And like Jehovah God in the Old Testament, breathes out the Spirit upon people to give them either biological or spiritual life. Here we see Jesus doing the very thing, breathing out the Holy Spirit upon his apostles to give them spiritual life and power to do the work he's commissioned them to do. And you're telling me this passage somehow denies that Jesus is God? Let's go to Genesis 2, verse 7. Genesis 2, verse 7. Watch. Genesis 2, verse 7. And Jehovah God, Yahovah God, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So again, here's my challenge to the anti-Trinitarians. Quote a single passage in the Hebrew Bible where someone other than Jehovah God breathes out the spirit to give life, whether biologically or spiritually. Show me someone other than Jehovah God who pours out the spirit, breathes out the Holy Spirit, and then you have a case. The fact that Jesus breathes out the Holy Spirit upon his followers shows he must be God in the flesh because that's something that only God does in the Hebrew Bible. Job 33, verse 4. Job 33, verse 4. Kenneth, if you're not patient, you're going to get blocked too. Okay. Job 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Spirit of God hath made me, the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. It is God's Spirit that he breathes out to create and give life. This is what Job 33, 4 is telling you. It is the Spirit of God that he breathes out of himself, without the Spirit severing from him, to create and give life. Did you catch it? And folks, it's going to be a little slower than normal because I'm taking questions and answering live by the power of the Holy Spirit, trusting the Spirit to enable me to answer correctly for the glory of Jesus. Okay. So are you saying that according to Hebrew Bible, according to the Hebrew Bible, Jehovah God breathes out the Spirit to give life, whether biologically and spiritually, so that when you quote John 20, 23 and ignore verse 22, you're either ignorant of the context or you're dishonest. Because 22 shows you Jesus is doing what only God can do. Breathe out the Holy Spirit to give spiritual life and power for his followers to do the work he sent them out to do. Right? You see that the very context of the verse that was cited shows that Jesus is doing what God does and only God can do. So if you got that point. Let me show you what's even more ironic. This is the same chapter where Thomas worships Jesus as his Lord and God. Let's go to John 20, 27 to 29. John 20, verses 27 to 29. All life, Richard, comes from the Holy Spirit. Biological life, plant life, marine life. 
spiritual life that is from the holy spirit okay john 20 27 to 29 read with me then saith he to thomas reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing now notice thomas's response verse 28 and thomas answered and said unto him my lord and my god now i'm going to emphasize that part unto him the Greek words are ipen auto, to him, not to someone else, not to them. He said these words, directed these words directly to Jesus, to him, my Lord and my God. And notice Jesus' response in verse 29. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Now notice the interchange, the interplay here. Thomas said unto him, and Jesus said unto Thomas. Notice, it says Thomas answered and said unto him, and then Jesus answered and said unto him. No one would deny that Jesus Christ in 29 is speaking to Thomas directly, directing his words to Thomas. Therefore, in the context, you cannot deny that Thomas directed his words to Jesus, said these words to Jesus and Jesus alone, and so he looked at the risen Christ and his glorified physical body and said to the risen Christ, you are my Lord and my God. Right? Did you catch it? So why would someone quote John 20, 23 to prove that Jesus is in God simply because he can forgive sins? Because even the disciples can forgive sins and they're not God. And ignore verse 22, which shows Jesus breathing out the Holy Spirit, something that only God does. And then ignore the end of the chapter where Thomas worshiped Jesus as his Lord and God. And Jesus blesses that confession. Right? Now, let me show you why Thomas's worship of Jesus Christ is astonishing. Why Thomas's worship of Jesus Christ is astonishing. You challenge the anti-Trinitarians and say, according to the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, do Israelites worship someone other than Jehovah as their Lord and God? In other words, can an Israelite say to someone other than Jehovah, you are my Lord and my God? Okay. You understand the question? According to the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, does an Israelite have someone other than Jehovah or someone along with Jehovah as his Lord and God. In other words, can an Israelite worship someone other than Jehovah or someone in union with Jehovah as his Lord and God? You know what the answer is? Absolutely not. You cannot worship a creature as your Lord and God instead of Jehovah or alongside of Jehovah. The only Lord God that an Israelite has is Jehovah. The only Lord God that an Israelite has is Jehovah. So now let's go to Psalm 35, 23. Psalm 35, 23. Let me prove it to you. And Protestant post Psalm 35, 23 and John 20, 28 back to back. David saying, stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. My God and my Lord. Now read. Thomas's worship of Jesus, John 20, 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Did you see the language is identical with only one exception? The words are reversed. David says to Jehovah, you are my God and my Lord. Thomas says to Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. Now, when you read the Greek translation of Psalm 35, 23, now I'm going to give you the Erasmian pronunciation of the Greek. Pay attention. Psalm 35, 23 in the Greek version and the Greek translation is Psalm 34, 23. Psalm 34, 23. And there the Greek says, Ha theosmu, ha kuriasmu. Ha theosmu, ha kuriasmu. Ha theosmu, ha kuriasmu. Literally, the God of me and the Lord of me. The God of me and the Lord of me. That's the Greek translation of Psalm 35, 23. The Greek of John 20, 28, because John wrote in Greek. Thomas says to Jesus, Ipen auto ha kuriasmu kai ha theosmu. 
ha kuriasmu kai ha theasmu. Literally, the Lord of me and the God of me. So the Greek version has David saying, the God of me and the Lord of me. The Greek version of Thomas's confession and John has Thomas saying, the Lord of me and the God of me. It's virtually identical. Now, can I ask you a question, folks? Can I ask you a question? Since Thomas is a monotheistic Jew, and he knows the Old Testament, and he knows that he cannot worship someone other than Jehovah as his Lord and his God, as his Lord God, or worship someone alongside of Jehovah as his Lord and God, how could Thomas worship Jesus as his Lord and God, his Lord and his God, and then Jesus bless that confession if Jesus is a creature? Richard, you're killing me with your questions. You're tempting me to block you. But I love you, Richard. I know you mean well. Did you get it? Is that clear? So if someone ever misquotes John 20, 23 to prove that, see, the disciples can forgive sins and they're not God. So Jesus isn't God because he has the ability to forgive sins. You look at 22 where Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit, something that only Jehovah does, and then read the ending of the chapter. Okay, but wait, I got a little more, and I'm going to come back to answer. Does this mean disciples can say, I forgive you, or you are forgiven? I'm going to get to that if you're patient. Okay. Okay, now, here's what I want you to look at. Protestant believer, post John 20, 28, and 2017 back to back. John 20, 28, and 2017, back to back. Okay, watch here. Hope this is not boring, you guys. Okay, watch here. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Earlier, Jesus Christ says to Mary Magdalene, notice what he says to her in the same chapter, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. Pay attention to this. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I send to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Did you catch it? Jesus says, my father has now become your father and my father who is my God is your God. Okay, wait. The father is the God of the apostles. Jesus is also the God of the apostles because in that same chapter, Thomas says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. So the Father is Thomas's God, and Jesus is Thomas's God, but an Israelite only has one God. And yet the Father is not the Son, they're distinct persons, and yet they can't be two gods that Thomas worships and looks to, because an Israelite can only have one God. Jehovah is his God and his God alone. So the Father is Thomas's God, that means the Father is Jehovah. But then Jesus is Thomas's God, that means he must be Jehovah as well. But Jesus is not the Father. Oh, that's why we became Trinitarians. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. Welcome to my world. Won't you come on? Did you catch it? So Jehovah, who is Israel's God, who is the only God that an Israelite, or anyone else for that matter, can worship and confess, is now identified as the Father and the Son. No, it's not a mistranslation. Is Jesus a mistranslation sneakers corner? Is Josiah a mistranslation speakers corner? No, it's not a mistranslation. Okay. Now, but here's the problem, folks. It says that the Father is not just the God of the apostles. The Father is also the God of Jesus. But how can Jesus have a God if he is God? Right? You see that objection? How can Jesus be God if the Father is his God? I'll answer that right after this, but let me answer the question. Does John 20, 23 say that bishops and priests have an authority to forgive sins? Yes and no. Yes and no. Okay. What do I mean? 
Are you ready for the answer? Yes and no. Are you ready for the answer? Yes, a bishop, a priest, and any Christian who preaches the gospel can forgive sins in this way. Telling someone, believe in Jesus Christ, turn to him, and accept him as your Lord and Savior, and you'll be forgiven of your sins. But if you don't believe in, believe in him, you'll be condemned in your sins and go to hell. But no, they cannot say, I forgive your sins that you've committed against God. I forgive your sins that you committed against this individual. That they cannot do because that's not what Jesus is saying the apostles were given the authority to do. Let me explain again. In the context of John, Jesus is commissioning the disciples to preach the gospel. What he means when he says to them that you can remit someone's sins, forgive their sins, or you can condemn someone in their sins is not that they go around saying, hey, I forgive you of your sins against God and against mankind. Or you know what? I condemn you for your sins against God, against mankind. You're going to hell. That's not the meaning of Jesus's words. How do I know? Because just read the gospel of John, the letters of John to see how John understood that authority and how he applied it and discharged it. Let me show you how John understood the words of Christ and how he discharged that duty given to him. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Who's ready to show or to see what Jesus meant? No. Why would I go to Acts when this is in John? And I want to first prove my case from John before I go to Acts. Kenneth, learn this principle. If someone's quoting a particular book or author, stick with that book or author to make your case before you go somewhere else. John 20, 30 to 31. John 20, verses 30 to 31. John 20, verses 30 to 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in his book. But these are written, pay attention, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. That's how they forgave people of their sins or condemned them, by telling them, accept this gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for you and rose again. Turn to him and you'll be forgiven. You'll be given eternal life. Reject him and you will remain condemned in your sins. You catching it? Did you understand how they went about forgiving or condemning? Now let's go to the epistle of John. 1 John chapter 1, 7 to 10. 1 John chapter 1, 7 to 10, verses 7 to 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, notice how he's forgiving sins, how John is forgiving sins. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You see what John is saying? Confess your sin to God, turn to God, believe in Jesus, and he forgives you, and you're washing the blood of Jesus. That's what it means. That's what it means for the apostles to remit sins or to retain sins by pronouncing the gospel of Christ and telling people, if you believe in this gospel, your sins are forgiven, you're washing the blood of Jesus. You don't believe it, you remain in your sins, you're condemned, you're going to hell. Okay, now, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Roberto, you're, you're going to leave right now. Send Roberto on his merry way. Block him so he doesn't return. 1 John chapter, one, verse, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Okay. My little children, 
these things write I unto you that ye sin not. Don't sin anymore. However, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now notice what he says in two. Okay. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. Do you see what he said? Notice what he did not say. If you do sin, I forgive you. No, no. But if you do sin, don't worry. You have an advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, who intercedes for you. He's the one who offered his life to appease God and remove our sins. So turn to him. Making sense now? 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. I can go on and on and on to show you what Jesus meant and how the apostles understood him. 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. What else do you want? He just explained it. You don't have the Son of God, you don't have life. You remain in your sins, you're condemned, you go to hell. If you have the Son of God, you have life, you're forgiven, the blood of Jesus washes you. You, you with me there? Is that clear? So does John 20, 23 support the belief of our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who belong to these liturgical churches that the priest has been given authority to say, I release you, remit you from your sins. I forgive you of your sins. Is that the meaning of this passage in the context? And it's not an attack on them. Something can be true even though you're using the wrong verse to prove it. Okay, let me repeat it again. You can have a belief or a position that is correct in the eyes of God, but you're using the wrong verse to substantiate it. You get my point? So I don't want people to get upset and start stoning me. What I'm saying is this passage does not support the belief that the priest or the bishop has the power to remit your sin, right, or retain your sin by pronouncing absolution. This is the wrong use, the wrong passage, and the wrong use of the passage. In the context, what the Lord Jesus meant by those words is explained by John himself. By sending us out into the world to preach the gospel, we now have the authority to say, this is the gospel that saves you. You believe in it, you're forgiven. You reject it, you're condemned. Because what was the context of 23? The Lord Jesus commissioning them and sending them out. John 20, 21. Clear? John 20, 21 is the context. And said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. You see, it's the commission. I'm it's not talking about the context of the church, the offices of the church, the liturgy of the church, the positions of the church. It's talking about evangelizing the world. This is the context. I'm sending you out into the world. That's the context of whosoever sins you remit, they've been remitted. You with me there? Yes, Vine. Just for the record, I know people won't agree with me. Protestants will get upset at me. Here's my belief, Vine. I believe there are true, born-again, spirit-filled believers in all the major branches of Christianity that are Trinitarian. You with me there? 
A non-Trinitarian belief is heretical because it denies the true God. It has a false God. Okay, so is that clear? Did I answer John 20, 23? Jesus, yes, devil, no. Keep distracting us with your personal issues. You're going to get blocked. Medic, are you saying the Jehovah Witness use it to show that Jesus has a God over him? Juan Vallis, I just said, there are true believers in every major branch of Christianity. Okay. This will tie back. This will go back. Because there's too much false teaching, wrong teaching in the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, Adam Cadman, even now Roman Catholics are having a problem with your church. Right now, I was just watching Taylor Marshall, who was agonizing and heartbroken over these idols that the Pope, <clears throat> I don't know what exactly the Pope did, the Pachama, right? He just did a live stream where he's devastated because of the actions of the current Pope, because Roman Catholics are saying that this Pope is so far to the left that he's a disgrace and a shame to the Catholic Church. And that's why you have a lot of Roman Catholics who are set of acantists, set of acantism, where they believe that the current Popes are anti-Popes and that there is no true representative of Peter anymore, and the Antichrist will come from this church. So the problem is not with Protestants and Catholics. The problem is with Catholics and Catholics. Your internal strifes and divisions prove the fallacy, the falsity of the assertion that you need an infallible magisterium and infallible interpreters of the Bible to guide you straight because even with your so-called infallible magisterium, you got so many issues and so many scandals rocking your church that I think it's time for you to examine why are you a Roman Catholic? Right? So no, I could never be a Roman Catholic. There's too much false teaching, wrong teaching in the Roman Catholic Church, especially the papacy and the infallibility of the Pope. I cannot subscribe to it. It's unbiblical and it's not historical. So that's my honest answer. I don't want to upset you Catholics, but you're asking me honestly. Now with that said, with that said, let me again repeat. In spite of all the wrong and false teaching in the Roman Catholic Church, still there's enough truth that the Holy Spirit can use so that I say there are true believers in the Roman Catholic Church who are born again. And you see some of them even reacting to the damage of the Pope, Taylor Marshall. He is livid and heartbroken, and he doesn't know what to do. Watch his live stream today. Is it the Pachama idols? Right? Some scandal, something that the Pope just did from the river. Okay. Uh, Adam. Stop twisting my words and putting words in my mouth and stop playing the game of impeccability and infallibility. This is the problem with your church. You've defined infallibility in such a way it's a moving target. So when the Catholic says, when the Pope says something in private that contradicts the faith, well, he's not speaking from the seat of Peter. He's just giving his private view interpretation and he's not impeccable, even though he's infallible when he speaks to faith and doctrines. You have played fast and loose with the definition of infallibility that outsiders get disgusted with how desperate the Catholic argument for the infallibility, infallibility of the Pope happens to be. Stop playing these games with me, Adam Cadman, because you're not going to get far because I'm not an ignoramus when it comes to how you have to define and redefine and re-redefine infallibility so that when the Pope tells one of his best friends, an Italian atheist, in a conversation that Jesus wasn't God on earth, and the Italian atheist reports it. Then what you have is the Vatican going into damage control. Well, that's his interpretation of what the Pope said. Instead of the Pope just coming out and condemning, no, I didn't say that. Well, that's how he understood me. And besides, it's a private conversation, and that doesn't count against infallibility. Stop while you're ahead, friend. You're only convincing those who are convinced of your church. Outsiders look at you and say, my goodness, what else does the Pope need to do to show you that this concept of infallibility is a joke? It's not scriptural and it's not historical. Right? 
Anyway, I don't want to get into it because the Catholics are going to think I'm attacking them. Okay? And again, for the record, I can never be a Roman Catholic because there's too many errors, false teachings, wrong teachings, and I cannot submit to the Pope as the inf infallible vicar of Christ. Ain't going to happen because it's not true. Even though I believe there's a lot of beauty in the Catholic tradition, and there are Catholics who are saved in spite of Rome, not because of Rome. Okay? Yeah, that's another one. Groom mentioned it. You got popes kissing the Quran, an abomination of abominations. An abomination of abominations. Pope Paul kissed the Quran. And then you had the Chaldean Catholic bishop kissing the Quran. My goodness. What an abomination. I've even heard priests tell me that was wrong what he did. But again, that's because that's something he did, you know, in his own, what was the word they used? He didn't do it as a vicar of Peter on the seat of Peter ex cathedra. Come on. Are you serious? The vicar of Christ kisses this wicked, evil, satanic book. And then you have the Chaldean Catholic bishop, I believe. I guess they call him the bishop, the head of the Chaldean Catholic Church under the auspices of the Pope, kissing the Quran. And you're still going to tell me this man is the vicar of Christ, the successor of Peter, and he's still infallible. He's not impeccable. Get real. Get real. Man, sorry, sorry, Adam. You brought it up, and so please, in the future, don't bring it up to me because I love you, and I believe you're a brother in Christ, but I cannot be a Roman Catholic. I can't. I can't. Sorry about that. Okay. Anyway, we went on a tangent. Let's come back and answer the other argument, and I'll go into other issues. Let's look at John 20, 17 and Revelation 3, 12, because Revelation 3, 12 ties in with John 20, 17. And I'll answer Melchizedek as well. Just be patient. Okay. John 20, 17 and Revelation 3, 12. Okay. No, for me, choose Jesus. If you want to kiss someone's feet as an act of humility, okay, that's fine. My problem is kissing the Quran. For what reason? Did that Mullah Sheikh kiss the Bible? And even if he did, that doesn't justify you kissing the Quran. Okay, anyway, John 20, 17, and Revelation 3, 12. Let's read now, guys. Let's regroup, refocus by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's read John 20, 17, and then Revelation 3, 12. Read with me. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascended unto my father, I sent unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. So Jesus has a God after the resurrection. He is now raised immortal, and he says, The Father is my God. Revelation 3 12. Him that overcometh, this is Jesus Christ our Lord speaking. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Oh, so now Jesus in heaven, in glory, ruling on the Father's throne as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, says that he has a God. Right, my God, <clears throat> and the name of the city of my God, count which is in New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Right, we skipped something. Hold on, did you skip something again, Protestant? I'm gonna end up smashing you, laying hands on you. Okay, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon the name of my God. And then in the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. I'll smash myself, lay hands on myself. You got it. Did you see, folks? Jesus in heaven, speaking to John in heaven, from exalted status as king of kings and lord of lords, on the throne, ruling with the Father. And from heaven, he says, he has a God four times. So now, how can Jesus be God if he has a God? after the resurrection, and that God is the Father. Jesus says, my Father is my God, and he has a God in heaven who happens to be his Father. Right? In fact, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. 
Second Corinthians chapter one, verse three. Yep, Alex. I've answered this so many times. Alex answered as well. Send John on his merry way. Send him back so he can cross the Tiber and start kissing the Pachama idols. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice that God is the Father. He is the Father. So go to Ephesians 1.17. Ephesians 1.17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, so God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, but at the same time, he's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of him. Now, Paul is writing after Jesus is in heaven. So he says, God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Father is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's talking about Jesus now in heaven. The Father is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, and God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So who is Jesus' is God? God the Father. Who is Jesus' is God? God the Father. Are you with me there? So after the resurrection in John, Jesus says the Father is his God. In Revelation, when Jesus reigns in glory on the throne of the Father as King of kings and Lord of lords, he says that the Father is his God four times, he says it. Paul, writing after Jesus has entered glory and rules as king of kings, Lord of lords, says the Father is the God of Jesus Christ and God is the Father of Jesus Christ. So how do we answer this for a Jehovah's Witness or anti-Trinitarian? Very simple. Are you ready? Very simple. Very easy. I have articles, rebuttals, and videos on this. So I'm going to make it quick because I want to answer other questions. Okay. Articles, rebuttals. And videos on this. Very simple. If you know your Bible and you believe in and affirm it and live it in the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus, very easy. Jeremiah 32, 27. Nope, not the Spirit. Nowhere, Rebecca, are we told that the Father is the God of the Holy Spirit. And nowhere are we told the Holy Spirit is the God of Jesus, which actually proves my point. Rebecca, you'll never find a single verse in the entire Bible where the Father is said to be the God of the Holy Spirit. And you'll never find a single verse in the entire Bible where the Holy Spirit is said to be the God of Jesus, which proves my point. Thank you for bringing it up, and I'm going to explain it. Now, read Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am Jehovah, Yehovah, the God of all flesh. The God of all flesh. I'm going to repeat it again. I am Jehovah, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? So now, medic, you got it. John 1, 14. John 1, 14. John 1.14. Jehovah is the God of all flesh. John 1.14. Okay. And the word was made flesh. Bam. And the word was made flesh. Bam. Amen in Jesus' name. And the word was made flesh. Bam. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so... Before Jesus became flesh, he did not have a God over him. So you challenge the anti-Trinitarian heretics. Quote a single passage where Jesus in his pre-human existence, before he became flesh, had a God over him. Can't find it. It's not there. Can't find it. It's not there. Now, pay attention with me. Pay attention. Okay? Pay attention because I want you to learn your Bible. I want you to learn your faith. I want you to learn why you can have absolute confidence. The Bible you hold is 100% the words of God preserved. And that the God of the Bible is the true God. He's alive and Jesus is the God man. Okay. Jehovah says, I am Jehovah, the God of all flesh. The word became flesh. The father didn't become flesh. The Holy Spirit didn't become flesh. The word who is Jesus became flesh. So let me ask you a question. If the word is distinct from the father and the word becomes flesh and the father is God also, should it surprise you that when the word became flesh, the father became the God of the Word who became flesh. When the Word became flesh, why is it shocking that from the moment the Word became flesh, the Father who is God became his God as well? You get it? So then why would you 
be troubled with Jesus having a God when Jesus isn't just God in nature. He's also human in nature. He's flesh in nature. So Jehovah says, I'm the God of all flesh. The word of the Father, who is eternal, who is God in essence, he takes on flesh, becomes flesh. So when he becomes flesh, then the Father becomes his God when he's enfleshed. You with me there? Yes, Sal John, you got it. Now, why is the Father still Jesus is God after his resurrection? Zina, didn't you hear what I just said? Zina, were you being distracted by your nephew again so you can blame your nephew for your problems? I said, nowhere will you find the Father is the God of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit is the God of Jesus. I said that about three times, Zina. Zina, because you're Chaldean Assyrian, I know you exist to kill me because we Assyrians exist to kill each other. Okay? So now here's my question. Here's my question. And by the way, Zina, I have an article on this. Is the Holy Spirit Jesus is God as well? Here's my question for every one of you. After the resurrection, now that Jesus is in heaven, why would the Father still be his God, according to Paul and John the Apostle and John in Revelation? Same apostle wrote John, wrote Revelation. Because, Rebecca, you answered it. He's still in the flesh. This is why you need to know your Bible. You need to know your faith. You need to know the scriptures. Jesus is still in the flesh. Let me prove it to you. Revelation 22, 16. He's still man. He's still human. He's still enfleshed. That's part of your faith. You cannot deny Jesus is still human. He's still a man. He's still enfleshed. And he will remain human, enfleshed human, in a physical glorified body that's indestructible forever. Revelation 22, 16. Revelation 22, 16. Okay. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Let's post it one more time. Let's unpack this. I hope this Q&A is blessing you guys. I'm trying to answer as many questions as possible as the Spirit leads me. Okay. I'll do more of these in the future, Lord willing, or Jesus willing. Oh, so Zena, you're thanking your atheist friend because your Christian brother attacked you. Remember, there's a saying in Assyrian, Zena. Go to the one who makes you cry, not makes you laugh. So that tells you how much I love you, that I make you cry, hater. Okay, Revelation 22, 16. Read it with me again. Read it one more time with me. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am, not I was. He's speaking in glory. And he says, I am right now. Right now, I am the root and the offspring of David. Did you catch it? I want you to meditate on this part. Okay. Notice the present tense verb. I am, not I was. I am still the offspring of David. How can Jesus still be an offspring, a descendant, a son of David in heaven if he's not still human, if he's not still enfleshed? To ask the question is to answer it, right? Do you get the answer now? Jesus is still a human. He's still man. He's still enfleshed. And he's going to remain human, enfleshed forever. That's part of the price he paid to save us. No, not because of his flesh, Rebecca. That's a different reason. I have articles and a discussion on 1 Corinthians 15, 28, which is what you're referring to. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, and 28. If I have time, I'll answer it, Rebecca. If not, I'll answer it in a future session, Lord willing. That's not because of his flesh so per se. It, it's, it's part of it, but I wouldn't articulate the way you did. It's because as the God-man, he's our human representative. Becoming man, he represents us before the Father, and he rules on our behalf in our place as our representative. What 1 Corinthians 15 is saying, Rebecca, is that when the end comes and the kingdom is fully restored to God and the earth and the heavens are made perfect forever and there is no more evil, no more wickedness, only glorified believers dwelling in a perfect heaven and earth in moral incorruption where they will never sin again, never bring sin into the world again. At that stage, the Lord won't need to represent us anymore. 
because he will give us the kingdom to rule on earth on behalf of the Godhead. So he gives it up in his role as our representative. Because right now, Jesus rules not just as God, but as the God-man, as man. And in his rule as man, he's representing us. Giving us the guarantee, the assurance that the earth will be our possession. And we'll rule over the earth at the end. So when the end comes and the rule has now been given to us to rule over the earth on behalf of God, in the place of God, as we worship God, then Jesus won't need to rule in that sense anymore. So that role he will give up because now the rule has been given to us. You understand what I'm saying, Rebecca? I wouldn't you I wouldn't articulate it that way medic. I would say Jesus as the an eternal divine person. Natures are what you are. I would say Jesus as an eternal divine person. As a divine person, as God, he has no god over him. But when he becomes human and he takes on a human nature and becomes man, from that moment on the father becomes his god. So in respect to his divinity, the way you're saying it, as a divine person who's eternally existed, he has no God. But when that divine person becomes flesh, from that moment on, the Father becomes his God. Jesus did marry. He married the church, Zach. The church is the bride of Jesus Christ. He doesn't need to get married to a physical woman and have sex like your prophet did. Okay, Everyone with me there? Now, coming back to the issue again, coming back to the issue again. Do you see why Jesus has a God over him in heaven? Do you see why Jesus has a God over him in heaven? Does everyone understand why Jesus has a God over him in heaven? Because he's still human. He's still in flesh. He's a man with a physical body. Okay. Don't say flesh has a God. Say because Jesus became flesh, he's now human. And as a human being, he has a God. Because when you talk about flesh and divine nature, you're, you're depersonalizing the issue. It's a person who has a God, not a nature. But the reason why that person has a God is because of his nature. You understand what I'm saying? See, you're a human being and a human person. As a human being, a human person, you have a God over you. Because being human means you're a creature created. So let's try to be more precise in our language. I know what you're saying and you're correct in what you're saying. But the way you're saying it can be confusing. We don't speak of natures, right, as persons. Natures is what a person is. So I don't say, oh, the flesh has a God. Well, flesh is not a person. It's what a person is, what an animal is. I'd say that person has a God by virtue of becoming flesh. That person has a God by virtue of becoming human. Because he's a human being, he has a God over him. You see? Keep it personal. Do not depersonalize it. You understand my point? Speak of the person, not the natures of the person, because natures are not personal they are what a person happens to be. So I don't say, oh, the flesh, divine nature. No, the person who became flesh, he has a God. That person who became a human being, he has a God. Now, why does he have a God? Because he became flesh, because he became human. But focus on the person. Right? Okay. Now, to prove that Jesus only had a God... When he became human. Let me prove to you. Jesus only had a God when Jesus became human. Okay, you want the proof now, medic, everyone else? So I can go on to the other questions about women and about <clears throat> 1 John 5, 7. And maybe I'll have uh, time for a few more. Exactly, Justin H. I love the way you said it. Better than me. Don't try and parcel out the hypostatic union, the union of the two hypostasis, the two natures. Exactly. Beautifully put, Justin H. God bless you. Okay. All right. 
Psalm 22 is a psalm about the suffering, resur resurrection, vindication, glorification of the Messiah. Psalm 22 is about the Messiah suffering, dying, being raised, being glorified, being vindicated. Let me prove that to you. The opening words of Psalm 22, verse 1. Let's tie it in. And thank first and last, he's going to be posting for us. Because Protestant to go. To the chief musician upon Ajilith, Shahar, a psalm of David, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? So here, the psalmist begins with, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. Let me show you. This is a psalm of the Messiah. Psalm of the Messiah. Prophesying the Messiah suffering, death, vindication, glorification, resurrection. Notice what our Lord says on the cross. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did you see the first connection? Jesus quotes the opening words of Psalm 22, claiming this as a prophecy of himself. Do you guys see it? First connection? Okay, you guys see that, right? Okay, Psalm 22, verse 16. Psalm 22, verse 16. Psalm 22, 16. Watch here. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. You don't get any clearer. This is a prophecy of Jesus' death. They pierced my hands and my feet. Psalm 22, verse 18. Psalm 22, verse 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Reread this. Folks, read it with me again. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Repeat it again because we're creatures of repetition. We learn something when we hear something repeated over and over again by the grace of God's spirit. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. John 19, 23 to 24. John 19, 23 to 24. John 19, 23, 24. Okay, sorry. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Did you catch it? You see what the soldiers did to Jesus' raiment? Exactly what Psalm twenty-two eighteen 18 said they would do a thousand years before they did it, because David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to see the future Sufferings, death, resurrection, vindication, and glorification of the Messiah. Right? Okay, now, Psalm 22, verses 4 to 8. Psalm 22, verses 4 to 8. Read with me. Almost done. Almost done with this question. We're going to answer other questions. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. Now watch this. But I am a, I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and the spies of the people. Pay attention to what the psalmist says the people say about him. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on Jehovah the Lord, that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Did you pay attention to this? You pay attention to this? Send Muhammad back to his pagan black stone to smooch it and lick it like his pagan prophet did. His woman raping prophet. Okay. Now, let's go to Psalm 22. I'm sorry, not Psalm 22. Matthew 27. We're going to read 37 to 43. Matthew 27, 37, 43. Hanging on the cross. Notice what they say to him. Notice what they do to him. Matthew 27. 37 to 43. Okay. Zin, I'll answer your question too, and I'll give you the link to the article, God willing. 
We will. But pay attention, folks. Don't let the children of Satan distract you. And set up over his head his accusation. And this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So he's on the cross, right? Pay attention to what they do to him, how they treat him, what they say to him. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. Right? And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Hmm. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Sound familiar? They mock him, they scorn him, they laugh at him, and they say he trusted in God. Let God deliver him if he would have him. Does this sound familiar? Does this not sound like what you just read in Psalm 22? Verses 4 all the way to 8? Clear? Medic, everyone else? Clearly? So everything that the Psalm said would happen to the Messiah happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why am I showing you this? Because now I need you to pay attention. Psalm 22, verse 10. Here's why I need you to pay attention. Psalm 22, verse 10. Yep, there goes the buffering. Da, 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 da. Okay, Psalm 22.10. Read with me. Psalm 22.10. Read. The psalm is speaking. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. One more time. The psalm is speaking, because that's Jesus speaking through the psalmist by his spirit. So it's actually Jesus speaking. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Did you notice? You are my God from my mother's belly. From the time my mother conceived me, when I was conceived in the womb and I became human in the womb, that's when you have become my God. Clear? As a side note, this also shows that abortion is murder. Because Psalm 22.10 says that this child was human from his mother's conception. And from his mother's conception, Jehovah was his God. So here's a passage that you can show. Jesus only started to have a God when he was conceived in the womb of his blessed mother because that's when he became human at conception, thereby proving abortion is murder because life begins at conception. Right? Okay. Did we answer that question? Okay, now let's come back and answer the question. Can women be teachers? Okay, let me rephrase the question. Can women be elders and pastors? Okay, can women be elders and pastors? Let me answer that by showing you what the Bible teaches as a whole. Okay, are we ready now? No, not all of them, Zena. Not every one of them is Jesus speaking. Sometimes it's just David or one of the psalmists complaining to God whining to God, crying out to God for their needs. Okay. Now, in the Bible, you'll find women given every position assigned to a man from being a prophet to being an apostle to being an evangelist to praying, prophesying, and teaching to even being deaconesses. But the only office never given to a woman is that of bishop slash elder. When the Bible gives the qualifications of a bishop slash elder, it only refers to males who have wives, but it never gives the same qualifications to women who have husbands. Are you with me there? I don't know who you're saying it's wrong because you're going to embarrass yourself if you're saying if I'm wrong. You're really going to get humiliated, Graham. And it's going to be my pleasure to humiliate you. Okay. Let me give you the chapters which speak of the qualifications of bishops and, and deacons. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1, all the way to 13. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. Okay, Graham, I know you're now manifesting like the dog you are. Quote a single passage in the New Testament where a woman is assigned the office of bishop and where qualifications are given for female elders. 
Okay? Stop barking. Show me your bite. Not 1 Timothy 1 to 13. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. No, fightless. You quoted the wrong translation. Fightless, 1 Timothy 3.11 doesn't say, right, <clears throat> that deaconesses cannot exist. I'll prove it to you. 1 Timothy 3.11. I'm waiting for Graham. Graham, you're going to get blocked if you don't give me a verse in the Bible where a woman is said to be a bishop slash elder or where the qualifications of female elders are listed. Don't waste my time. Yes, you can ask about Islam as well. We're waiting, Graham. You got less than a minute to quote the passage. Say, send this person on his merry way. You see the coward? I'm wrong and can't refute me scripturally. Okay. Okay, let me repeat. You'll find women who are called prophets. You'll find women who pray and prophesy. Women went with the apostles to evangelize. You'll find women deacons, deaconesses. But the one thing you won't find is a woman called a bishop slash elder slash overseer or qualifications for a female bishop. Now to correct fightless, fightless. 1 Timothy 3.11 is talking about the qualification of a female deacon. Are you with me there? Now write down these chapters, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, and then write down Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 16, specifically to 14. So write this down, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, and then Titus chapter 1, verses 5 all the way to 16, but it really ends at 14, okay? You with me there? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 16. These are the only two places in the entire New Testament where the qualifications of a bishop is given, and it's limited to males, to men. Women are not mentioned. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 to 13, the qualifications are of deacons are given, but then in verse 11, it mentions a woman who qualifies for the office of deacon. Yes, you can. It doesn't say you have to be married to be a preacher, a teacher, or a pastor. It's saying if you're married, then make sure you have only one wife. You with me there? Is that clear? That people can be celibate and be bishops and deacons and pastors and evangelists? Yeah, it's in the Bible. Jesus said, some are given the gift of celibacy where they don't have desires and don't need to get married because God has given that grace not to want to get married. That's Matthew 19, verses 10 to 12, as well as 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 7. A deacon is a servant who serves on the authority and command of a, of a pastor. A pastor is what we call bishop, what we call overseer, what we call elder, Right? Pastor is the same title and office of a bishop, of an overseer, of an elder. An elder is an overseer, is a, is a bishop. It's the same office. A deacon is a servant to the pastor. Okay? So the bishop assigns roles, functions, responsibilities to the deacon. With me there? Now, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Let's read verses 8 to 10. Let, uh, fight less. Be patient. I'm going to get to verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. Not one means yes, two means no. Read with me. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, not after money, not drunkards, right? How, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved, test them, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Now, guys, pay attention to verse 11. Verse 11. First name, last name, I've already refuted it. David and I did a full exposition on Ezekiel 14.9. I have articles. Go listen to them. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faith in all things. Now, 
don't get upset at me because I'm the last one to want to correct the King James Bible because there were 54 scholars of the highest eminence who love Jesus, whose scholarship is unquestionable that rendered the King James Bible. However, if you read a printed edition of the King James, you will see that the word there is in italics. Let me show it to you. Let's see if it happens here. First Timothy 3.11. You with me there? I don't want you to think I'm correcting King James. I love the King James, right? It's the Bible for me. However, I want to note something. Okay, let's go to 1 Timothy 3.11. When the King James translators put word in italics, those are words that they supplied. They supplied. It's not in the Greek. That doesn't mean it's wrong. Sometimes you need to supply words to make the sentence read more smoothly. Okay, but let me get to 1 Timothy 3. Now, I see why I have people reading for me. So by the time I turn to a, to a chapter, okay, let me see if it's in italics. Yep. If you have a printed King James, you'll see that the words must there is italicized, are italicized. When you see it italicized, for those of you who read the King James printed, anytime you see words in italics, italicized, that's an indication by the translators these words were supplied, were added to make the sentence read more smoothly. It's not in the Greek manuscripts. Are you with me there? Let's see if the online version has it. Let's see if the online version has it. Okay. Yep, here's the online version. Here's the online, online version. There you go. Click on it. You'll see must there are in italics, italicized. Okay. Fight list. If you're going to debate me, I'm going to muzzle you. Either you're asking because you want to learn or you're here to argue and I'm going to shut you up. Okay. Titus 3.11. Okay. Now, why is that important? If you're not here to learn, don't waste my time. I didn't invite you to come. You don't need to come. If you want to learn, listen. Don't argue with me. I promise you're going to lose. Call me arrogant if you want. Okay. Watch here. Watch here. Now, I want you to go click on the link and look at the Greek text. Okay. And I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not trying to pretend to be. All right. Notice the word is gonaikas. Gonaikas. Erasmian pronunciation. Gonaikas. It's the word gunai. Literally, that means woman. Don't take my word for it. Go there. Do you see that the word in the Greek is gonaikas? It can mean wives, but it can also mean women. But what I want you to notice is the word there is not in the text. It doesn't say there. It's not in the text. Check it out. Do you see it? Okay. Then flight list, Ridley. If you're asking sincerely, can you be patient? I'm not done with 11 to go to 12. Okay, brother? If you're sincere, I'll serve you. I love you and bless you for the glory of Jesus. If you're to debate, don't waste your time. Now, fight list, I want you to click on the link, and I want you to go there. Can anyone show me where the word there is? Does the Greek have the word there? Help me out, folks. I just gave you a link to the Greek. You don't even need to read the Greek. You can see it. And do you see the word gonaikas? Gonaikas? That's plural for gunai. Do you see that the lexicon renders it as woman? Because the word gunai means woman. It can be used for your wife. Okay. So here's the point. If you translate Titus 3.11 as likewise the woman, then that's referring to women deacons, not the wives of deacons. Are you with me there? If you translate... 1 Timothy 11 as, likewise, the woman, the woman also. That means verse 11 is not referring to the wives of deacons. 
It's referring to women who are deacons. You catch it? So the text is referring to female deacons, deaconesses, showing that unlike bishops, there's an office for women to assume the position of a deacon. Thank you, Andrew Martin. He just posted a translation that says, Women likewise, dignified, line standards, clear-minded, faithful in all things. Now, do you want me to give you proof that it's referring to women deacons and not the wives of deacons? Do you want me to give you proof that it's referring to women and not the wives of deacons, that women can be deacons as well? Let me know if you're ready for the proof. Okay, here's the proof. The proof is this. Why would Paul mention how the wife of a deacon must conduct herself, but say nothing about how the wife of a bishop, how a wife of a bishop should conduct herself? If he's referring to the wives, we'd expect him to refer to the wives of bishops in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, but he doesn't. So why mention how the wives of deacons should conduct themselves and say nothing about the wives of bishops? You with me there? If you're going to mention how wives should be, why don't you mention how the wives of bishops should be? Why just mention the wives of deacons? You with me there? Understand my point. Did you understand my point? Okay. But if it's not referring to the wives of deacons, but an office of deacons that women can also assume, then now it makes sense why he didn't mention women in the list of qualifications of being a bishop. Because for Paul, a woman can't be a bishop, but she can be a deacon. You get it now? If Paul assigns the office of deacon to women, but not the office of bishop to women, then now it makes sense why in his list of qualifications for bishops, no mention of women, but in his list of qualification of deacons, there's a mention of women. You see how it works? Because if you're saying it's speaking of wives of deacons, then why not say something about the wives of bishops? So you're going to tell deacons how their wives should conduct themselves, but say nothing about the bishops and their wives? Did that make sense? Did that make sense? Abashi, don't repeat your question again. I got it. Pay attention. Okay. Now let me give you some historical evidence historical proof from the early church that the church had female deacons. I want you to Google Pliny the Younger and Christians. Go to Google, put Pliny the Younger and Christians. Pliny the Younger was the governor of Bithynia around 112 AD of Turkey, Pliny the Younger. He's writing a report to the emperor, to Caesar, about the persecution of Christians, Gentiles who stopped worshiping the gods and sacrificing to the gods who who became Christian, and he's talking about how his investigation, interrogation, <clears throat> how it, it was affecting these converts to Christianity. Okay. In his letter, he mentions that Christians would gather early morning once a week, bind themselves to an oath to refrain from immorality and lying, and would sing a hymn to Jesus as to a God. So he's even telling you how the... Early Christians worship and how they lived. But then he mentions interrogating two of their women whom they call deacons. Did you know that? He says that he interrogated two women who were deacons of the church. You with me there?
You with me there? So you have a pagan ruler, the governor of Bithynia in Turkey, talking about the Christians of his time, 112 AD, a decade after John wrote Revelation and the Gospel of John, according to most opinions. And he's telling us that they would meet once a week early morning and they would bind themselves to an oath, swear that they'd refrain from morality and lying, cheating, and they would sing a song to Jesus as to a God. So they were worshiping Jesus as divine. And then he talks about torturing some of them, interrogating them, and interrogating two women who were deacons. Are you with me here? So I can find and show you where women are deacons, where women are prophets, where women are even sent with the apostles, right? To preach, evangelize, to teach, where women are told they can pray and prophesy, but I can't find you a woman who is said to be an elder slash bishop slash overseer. Let's go to Romans 16, verse 7. Oh, see here, first and last posted. Wait, 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 before we go on. First and last just posted the quotation from Pliny the Younger. God bless you, brother. Let's read it. Let's read what Pliny the Younger wrote. He just gave you the link and he posted it. They were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively to a hymn to Christ, as to a God, and bind themselves by oath, not to some crime, but not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery, nor falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. Right? And if you continue quoting, now watch this. He just quoted it. Thank you. Accordingly, I judge it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses, but I discovered nothing else but depraved, excessive superstition. What do you want? Thank you, first and last, for quoting the citation from Pliny the Younger, showing that I accurately represented his saying. I gave you the gist of it accurately. And did you see what he just said? Two female slaves he tortured who were called deaconesses. Do you catch it? No, the reason why only men are bishops and elders, Giovanna, let me explain it to you why. Let me explain it to you. Christ is the husband of the church, right, Giovanna? Christ is the husband of the church, right? Okay. Who stands in the place of Christ as ruling over the flock on behalf of Christ? Bishops, right? How can you have a female representing a husband? You with me there? How can you have a female representing the husband? If Jesus is the husband and the bishop is in the place of Christ, ruling on behalf of Christ, his bride, his flock, then of course it has to be male. Hey, Sahi, what's up, bro? I haven't seen you in a while. I'll see you again. Okay, you with me there? Is that clear? No. Diakonos, diakonos refers to someone who serves. Now notice Romans 16, verse 7. And who told you the church is in the bride of Christ? Are you even listening to me, Jovan? Jovan, let me try it again before I send you on your merry way. If the church is the bride of Christ and Christ appoints bishops to rule over his church on his behalf, how can you have a woman ruling the church on behalf of Christ as his representative if the church is his bride? I just said that. Are you listening, Giovanna? Are you wasting my time asking me a question you don't want an answer for? Okay, Romans 16, 7. Read with me. Okay, Romans 16, 7. Guys, read with me. Here's where you're going to get shocked. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Did you know Romans 16, 7 has become a nightmare to many Christians today? Do you know why? Uh, Giovanna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to block you after I answer you because you're being stupid now. I know the bishop is the pride of Christ. 
But God sets apart a member of the church to represent him ruling over the church. So yes, the bishop, though a part of the bride of Christ, is then set apart to represent Christ as he rules over the bride, and therefore that's why he's male. Because you think you're being smart, a smart aleck, you're only exposing your stupidity. Bye-bye, Giovanna. Send him on his merry way. Okay. Romans 16, 7. Let's read. Read Romans 16, 7. Yep. And Jesus, our Lord, Romans 16, verses 1 and 2. Phoebe is called our, a deacon. Thank you. But I want you to pay attention to Romans 16, 7. Let's read it one more time. And Charles Dickens, that means if there are no males or females, that means females can get men pregnant and men can carry babies full term and conceive children because there's no more males or females, right? And if there are no more Jews and Gentiles, that means ethnically there are no more Jews and ethnically there are no more non-Jews. That's not the point of Galatians 3.28. But anyway. So you're making a case for transgenderism and trans ethnicity. Romans 16, 7, one more time. Read with me, guys. I need you to pay attention. I need you to pay attention. Okay. Salute Andronikos and Junia, my kinswoman, my kinsmen, I'm sorry, and my fellow prisoners who are known among the apostles who also were in Christ. Now, one more time, we're going to quote it. Zach Ali, I know you want Jesus to be like your filthy prophet who was a dog who prostituted the woman like whores, calling it muta, and then raped captive women, even married ones, commit adultery. Jesus is not your filthy Muhammad. Okay. Romans 16, 7. Read with me. Okay. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Now, if you're paying attention... Pay attention. Junia is a female. It's a female name. Notice what Paul says, right? He says that Junia is among the apostles and she's a noted apostle. This passage has troubled people to this day. But if you look at the earliest sources, Junia was a female considered to be an apostle. Now, some try to get around it by saying among the apostles means she was in their midst, among them, she wasn't one of them. That's not the plain meaning of the text, nor was it understood this way historically. Let me just, let me find a book that I recommend you guys reading. Hold on, let me find this book. It's in my library, I have to read it. Let's see. Eldon J. Epp, Junia, the first woman apostle. Here it goes. Get this book. For you serious students of the Bible, Eldon J. Epp is one of the leading scholars of the text of the Greek New Testament. He's got an entire book on this very passage, and he looks at history, the early church fathers, and, and the manuscript tradition, and he shows historically Junia was a female who was an apostle. Here it is. I gave you the link. I don't need to write it. Get this book. Okay. So here you have Romans 16, 7, a female said to be among the apostles, meaning she was an apostle. What is an apostle? Someone sent out to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay. Let me further prove to you that you can have female apostles. Let's go to Philippians 4, verses 1. All the way to three. Philippians 4, verses 1 to 3. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 16. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 16. Philippians 4, verses 1 to 3. Guys, pay attention now. Pay attention. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Now watch this. I beseech you, you odious man, these names, and beseech Stintiche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women, those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Did you catch it? Women and men, 
were co-laborers with Paul, meaning they labored with Paul in preaching the gospel and converting people and supporting the ministry, women and men. Yep, women can teach under the authority of a male bishop. So, Rebecca, if a male bishop tells you, Rebecca, come up and pray, come up and read this text, come up and teach, then you can do so. But you have to do it under the authority of a male bishop. Yep, exactly, groom. You can. That's why Eldon J.F. shows that Junia is feminine in our oldest manuscripts and our oldest witness. But as time went on, they changed it into a masculine form of the name because they were troubled by a female apostle. Gruen, this is all in the book. He covers it. You hear me there? Get that book and read it. I have to find it because I got to read it. Okay. So let me show you places. Let me show you places. Where women are also prophets. Are you ready for that? You want me to show you where women are prophets? If it's specific for the New Testament, it applies for all times and all generations and all churches till Christ returns. Okay. Exodus 15 20. Exodus 15 20. Habishas, you repeat that again, and I'll send you to Mecca to visit Medina. Exodus 15, verse 20. And Miriam the prophetess, did you catch it? Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. So Miriam is a prophetess, but she's also one of the three leaders of Israel. Did you know that? God sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, his, their sister, as leaders over Israel. Are you ready for that proof? Miriam is a prophetess and a leader of Israel. Okay, Micah 6.4, Micah 6.4, Micah 6.4. You thought wrong. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Did you catch it? Israel had three leaders, Moses, Aaron, their sister Miriam. And she, like Moses and Aaron, was a prophet. She was a prophetess. Another female leader of Israel who was a prophet, prophetess. Judges chapter 4, verse 4. Judges chapter 4, verse 4. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipidoth, she judged Israel at the time. Did you guys catch it? Judging Israel means ruling over Israel. So Deborah is a prophetess who ruled over Israel like Samson, like Samuel, so on. Did you catch it? Hmm, interesting. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1. Keep going all the way. Read the next Two verses. Moreover, the Lord Jehovah said unto me, Take thee a great scroll and write in it with a man's pen concerning Mahar Shalal Hajbez. Now give me two and three. Keep reading these names, boy. And I took my faithful witness to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah, the son of Jeberechiah, and I went into the prophetess. Wow, Isaiah the prophet is having sex with a prophetess, his wife. I went into the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said Jehovah the Lord to me, call his name Mahar Shalal Hajbez. Wait, you have a male prophet Isaiah and a female prophet, a prophetess, married to Isaiah. Hmm. So you have a couple that are prophets. Isaiah's a prophet. She's a prophet. Wow. Hmm. <whistles> Interesting. No, that's that doesn't make her a prophetess because that means every wife... Married to a prophet was a prophetess. Nope. Okay, now let's go to Luke 2. Luke 2. Let's read Luke 2, 37 to 39. 37 to 39. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hi. Right. Scared me. 
made me to jump. Almost done. I'll be done. Luke 2, 37, 39. Watch here. And I'm sorry. Let's start. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's start at 36. Let's go to 36 to get her name. I'll read from 37. And she was a widow about four score and four years. So she was a widow for 84 years. Okay. She was a widow, four score. Okay, now we lost the verses. Oh, my goodness. No, you didn't need to retract it, brother. It's okay. And there was one Anna, a prophetess. Did you guys catch it? Anna at the time of the birth of Jesus in the in the temple. Jesus is born. He's being presented in the temple. And here's a prophetess named Anna. Okay. The daughter of Phanuel. Anna, prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Aser. She was of great age and had lived with the husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years, 84 years which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Okay, And she, coming in the instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Right, And when they had performed all these things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Did you catch it? Anna the prophetess prophesying at the time of Jesus' birth being presented to the temple. Finally, Acts 21, 8 to 9. Acts 21, 8 to 9. And I'm going to have to end it here. Acts 21, 8 to 9. Acts 21, 8 to 9. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered in the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Right? And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Did you catch it? Four daughters, which did prophesy. Prophesy. You want me there? Four daughters which prophesy. So Acts 2, 36 to 38. So Acts 2, 2, 2, 25 to 35. Acts 2, 36 to 38. Isaiah 8, verses 1 to 3, specifically verse 3. Judges chapter 4, verse 4. Exodus 15, 20 with Micah 6, 4. And Acts 21, 9. Here you have females who are prophesying, who are prophets. They are prophetesses. Is that clear? Clear? Now, contrast this with Islam, where Muhammad said, Allah never raised a female prophet, and if you have a female leader, then you're cursed and condemned. You see the difference? Islam teaches... God never raised females to be prophets. And if you have a female leader, leader, you're cursed, you're condemned. It's in the traditions. And yet the God of the Bible raises up females to be prophets, to be apostles, to be deacons, to prophesy, to pray, to teach, to preach, to evangelize. The only office they cannot, cannot assume is that of a bishop slash elder slash overseer slash pastor. Okay, folks, my time is up. Lord willing. I'll do a session on Monday. God willing, I won't be around Sunday. I hope this blessed you. I hope these questions were interesting, informative, and challenge you to think more deeply about the Bible and understand the Bible more deeply. And I'll live it up, live it out more powerfully, more passionately by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Wash us in your blood. Wash my daughters in your blood and seal us by your spirit in Jesus' name. Folks, don't forget to pray for me. Today, my youngest daughter, Zipporah, turns seven. It's her birthday, and sadly, Daddy won't be there. Pray God will miraculously fill them with his love, joy, and peace. God will fight for us and bring them to me and fight for me and destroy this wicked, corrupt system that it won't be against me but for me. Okay, guys? Love you, and Christ loves you more. Christ is risen, risen indeed.